The year was 1990. Fresh from the combined efforts of Chris Columbus and John Hughes, may the latter rest in peace, came one of the most well-known family comedy films slash franchises of all time. I'm of course talking about Home Alone, and that's no shit right there. The story revolved around an unintentionally left-behind 8-year-old kid, Kevin McAllister, portrayed by Macaulay Culkin, whose uncaring family takes off for Paris for their vacation. Eventually, our pint-sized hero adjusts to living solo, hence the aforementioned title, and in order to maintain the sanctity of both his house and his well-being, he confronts a pair of notorious wannabe burglars, the Wet Bandits, Harry Lime and Marv Merchants, portrayed by Joe Pesci and Daniel Stern respectively. Kevin even finds his inner saints upon connecting with the ever-so-rumored family murderer, next-door neighbor Old Man Marley, portrayed by Robert's Blossom, may he also rest in peace, who then becomes the avenging hero in the end. Thus, the Wet Bandits are detained and taken away to the Slammer, and Kevin and Marley reunite with their respective families, despite their sense of differences. Two years later, a sequel spawned, Lost in New York, in which it's the same frickin' routine, set the following year after the previous entry, except while Kevin attempts to have a perfect family vacation this time around, an unexpected shift occurs out of nowhere. While his family takes off for the Keys, in Florida to be precise, Kevin himself arrives in the Big Apple, and this is where the trivia comes in. Culkin was actually born and raised in Manhattan. It's also been a little over 30 years since he started acting, and some of his siblings, most notably Kieran and Quinn, the former who portrayed Fuller in both films, have been involved with his brother's upbringing in show business. With that aside, there in New York, after being released from prison, the Wet Bandits, here renamed the Sticky Bandits if you will, start way more shit than ever while Kevin adjusts to indie vacationing life in the big city at the Plaza Hotel, and is eventually fed up with it due to a series of twists and turns, hence the subtitle, obviously. Until yet another helping of inner sainthood is provided in the form of a local homeless pigeon lady, portrayed by Brenda Fricker, who was also in So I Married an Axe Murderer not long after. While both films garnered a hell ton of acclaim throughout the years, despite the latter gaining mixed to negative reception, the rest of the franchise spiraled into a chaotic downhill purgatory from which there was no chance of escape. A third film entry, released half a decade later, with Alex D. Lynn stealing Cook in Spotlight, considering he was past his teens at the time, which did way worse. And let's not get ourselves started with those atrocious ass two made for TV follow ups! Hell, the first two made their way into the game adaptation circuit, and those are where the focus of our latest review comes in. First things first, we're diving into the first three Home Alone games, based on the first film, all by THQ for the NES, developed by Bethesda, and even the Super NES and Game Boy, developed by Imagineering, all released 1991. You assume the control of Kevin upon starting, and basically you're supposed to stop the Wet Bandits in their path by using random home accessories, tools, toys, electronics, etc. Just like in the film, obviously. Buttons A and B are used to collect or possess, if you will, and set a trap respectively, while the select button cycles between the trap items you collect. Take note, you can only carry up to no more than three items. Eventually, I'll get to why the traps are about as useless as fucking Family Advice, 5-Hour Energy, Ritalin, and V8 combined, despite them being the only weapon Kevin uses. Should either of them get near you, 
it cuts to the infamous oh no game over themed cutscene, and depending on which version you're playing, it either features that same message popping out of the chimney, or a bastardized rendition of Kevin blurting it out, followed by your progress screen, which can be accessed at any time by pausing, followed by the title screen. And speaking of the progress screen, you're provided with a map of the house, indicating Kevin's location, as well as those of the Wet Bandits, complete with your overall score and how much time you've got remaining before the fuzz arrive. In terms of time, by the way, you're given exactly 20 minutes to guard your lair from those jackasses. Every time either Harry and or Marv get near a trap, they're temporarily stunned, thus giving you a fighting opportunity to escape from them. But if I were you, I'd keep the absolute sharpest eye out for their awakening. Other than patrolling certain sections of the house, Kevin can even traverse his backyard treehouse via the wire from his bedroom window, minus the broken handlebars used as a zipline. In terms of attempting to traverse down and or up certain stairs, that's another story in and of itself. You have to use the diagonal directions of which flight of stairs that you're about to travel. And before I forget, yes, Kevin can moonwalk, obviously. As you can tell right away, the gameplay aspect becomes monotonous at a shockingly accelerative rate, and the controls are ruptured and half-assed beyond every means of testing. While there's no checkpoints or continues, or even a password or save feature, there really isn't much to offer in the way of challenge. Basically, it's either you sit on your ass attempting to win, or you wind up getting nabbed. Unbelievable as it is, Harry and Marv travel at approximately one quarter the speed of a bullet, in other words, faster than Kevin does, and the chances are as high as Mount Everest and Taipei 101 stack together that they'll outsmart your ass in more ways than you think. Even more aggravating is the earlier stated stair navigation. When you're in the most desperate need imaginable, it'll take maybe less than five seconds, if in a bit more time, to maneuver that little bastard. Simply put, those factors will haunt you for the rest of your natural-born life worse than both Tommy fucking Wiseau and Buffalo Bill from Silence of the Lambs combined, no matter how often you play. As detailed as the in-game elements are, I wouldn't go so far as to expect anything on par with the likes of either Capcom, Konami, Tecmo, Taito, Irem, Jaleco, or hell, even Natsume. Despite the primary opposing characters looking exactly like they're supposed to, the out-of-place hues make both the trap items blend in very closely with the background, Hence, an unexpected test of wits and attrition as you're fulfilling your main goal. As for the stair perspective, it's less than appealing at best to say the absolute least. Seriously, I've seen a way better stair design in Adam's Family by Ocean than even this, and that was out the same goddamn year! For the overall music and sounds, composed by George Sanger and arranged by Julian Lefay, considering that none of the music is in any way related to the John Williams score, except maybe for the half-assed title theme. There's only five songs heard throughout the entire game, and believe me, I've heard way worse in my line of work, but this one takes the goddamn extra-large triple-decker four-cheese meat lover Zaz. Despite them being rather lively and bold, especially the main house theme, which is somewhat reminiscent of Run Run Rudolph, in reality, those songs can drone over you for an entire fortnight, if hell in a shorter time. Man, I'd rather listen to Troll 2's Naked Land, Chariot of God, Fire in the Water, and even your Never Too Old four times over per song. And don't even get me started with the goddamn sound effects. As soft and maybe obvious as they are, there's actually very little of them. And with that, moving on to the next set. Exhibits B and C respectively, Home Alone for both the Super NES and Game Boy. Again, both developed by Imagineering on behalf of THQ. Riley Sky 100, you have the floor. Hello everyone, this is Riley Sky 100 and I'll be talking about the Super NES and Game Boy versions of Home Alone. While the basic plot remains the same, the concept has been altered for both versions. Following a brief introductory cutscene outlining the Bandit's trademark intentions, you're introduced to a whole new gameplay aspect. A platformer, surprisingly, where your objective is to collect various valuables and drop them into the basement while keeping Harry and Marv and other robbers at bay. In order to complete a level, you have to drop a required number of items in the basement to obtain access down there, and with the backpack, you can only carry five items at a time. The controls are pretty sluggish, particularly with moving left and right, as well as the jumping, which makes precision jumping frustrating to pull off, not to mention staying clear of enemies all the same. Up makes Kevin enter doors, bureaus, boxes, cabinets, and reveal hidden objects while jumping, YB, and A makes Kevin pick between and or fire a certain weapon and jump, respectively. 
My problem with the controls, aside from the movement and jumping, is that when you first play this game, you wouldn't know where else to press up aside from the doors in a case where you're trying to go up a staircase and can't get on it until you find out that up does the work. Also, the shoulder buttons aren't used for any command as well as the X button. While the Game Boy controls are basic, it doesn't perform any better than the Super NES. For power-ups, you have to find and munch down on pizza slices, eight of them, or an entire box of pizza grants you an extra life. Cookies restore a portion of your life, and aftershave, should you come across any, for temporary invincibility. As for the weapons and traps, Kevin starts off with a pathetic as hell water pistol, only used to stun your enemies briefly, and advances to other powerful types, including a slingshot, good for only 10 slightly powerful shots upon collecting each one. Hmm, Dennis the Menace much? Alongside with a baseball, and even a BB gun. Huh, a Christmas story much? The latter series of offensive methods, the traps that is, include your standard banana peel and even random falling objects such as bowling balls, trophies, paint cans, irons, giant portions of bricks, and left behind articles used as floor obstacles like thumbtacks and toys. As for the aforestated enemies, aside from Harry and Marv, some include a mobster who will sneak in and snatch a valuable in record time if your wits aren't as sharp as attack, and miscellaneous thugs, not to mention rats, bats, tarantulas, and literally a ghost. Last time anyone checked, this game is supposed to be related to Christmas. I think he lost his way to Monster Party. Anyways, after dropping every last valuable item within the vault, it's time for one final step confronting the basement boss after dodging a huge pain in the taint onslaught of traps, animal enemies, and locking every valuable. Hell, each stage thereafter revolves around the same <laughs> Rack up valuables whose range depends on which stage you're in, and send every single collective array of them into the vault, munch on pizzas and cookies for life, out with the enemies, scour the basement and obliterate the boss, rinse, lather, repeat. Should you get hit three times, your ass is sent to the infamous Oh No screen, illustrated visually in terms of Kevin's trademark bathroom mirror reaction upon applying aftershave, accompanied by his trademark scream, and the same bastardized rendition applies to the Game Boy version, thus resulting in an instant life loss. Despite the breathtaking change both versions have, the gameplay aspect gets very repetitive at a more gradual rate in comparison to their NES sibling, and the controls are a trifle half-assed and out of whack, notwithstanding their negligible improvement. And take note, all three editions of the game were released in late 1991, around the same time as Act Razor, Super R-Type, Shatterhand, Vice Project Doom, Earth Defense Force, Metroid 2 Return of Samus, Battletoads, Fortified Zone, Wapum, and even Final Fantasy 2 aka 4 amongst others, and no matter how awesome those games are, parents and kids still chose this just because they thought the film was entertaining. Just because a film is wonderful, that doesn't necessarily translate to a good game. And believe me, there are more than an abundance of examples of such. Considering that both versions are only four stages long, except maybe for the Game Boy, there's very little to offer here in terms of difficulty, unless yet again, your instincts aren't sharp. Besides, the ending's not much to drool over either. It's just poorly rendered stills of the film. Kevin reuniting with his mom, and the wet bandits having their fumbled asses thrown and locked up in the old Who's Gal. Speaking of which... Speaking of indeed, Riley Sky, the graphics. And I'll take that from here for sure. Despite the overall visual presentation being slightly improved, in reality they're just bland, drab, and leaving tons to be desired. While I'll admit Kevin does look a sight like his film counterpart, that is, in terms of the daytime scenes, and the same story applies with his arch nemeses. God only knows, however, what to make of those newly created extra enemies. And once again, don't even get us started with those second fucking great film stills. Back to you, Riley Sky. Composed by Mark Van Heck, and here's a shot of the canon, the title music is actually a well-done if somehow uninviting rendition of the film's opening theme by John Williams, who's also credited in both versions, surprisingly. As for every other track, as vigorous as they attempt to be, in reality they're nothing more than a series of vexatious as hell downers after another, same situation with those ear rapey sound effects and repetitive, though inviting at first, sound bites of Kevin's usual quotes. On the upside, I do like the decent rendition of Chuck Berry's Run Run Rudolph. Notwithstanding THQ's efforts to recreate the exhilarating feel of the comedy film, 
In the presence of their undeniable truth, all three renditions just fail very, very miserably. No matter which version you play, there's little to no replay value and not much enjoyment to experience as opposed to the film itself, which is more than I can say for the next movie to video game adaptation, which neither the film nor game are remotely decent or funny. Speaking of the sequel, that wraps up this part. I agree wholeheartedly, Riley Sky. And if I were you, I wouldn't so much as waste your time and or hard earned Okani with either of them, like we did, at all. Moving on to exhibits D, E, and F respectively, Home Alone 2 Lost in New York, once again, all by THQ, developed by Imagineering, except they're all for the NES, Super NES, and Game Boy, released the exact same year as the film. Once again, refer back to the overall plot description I've outlined on which these entries are based, cause there's no fucking way I'm reiterating it! Upon starting, we're treated to an introductory cutscene of Mr. Hector, the Plaza Hotel Concierge, portrayed by Tim Curry, the old Rocky Horror Picture Show transvestite, phoning the authorities about Kevin's fraudulent credit card crimes, followed by yet another random phone call with those wet, aka sticky, bandit douches, made towards some of their associates about yet another arrangement to have Kevin wipe the hell out. And well, it's the same slightly updated platformer horseshit as in the Super NES and Game Boy versions of the previous game. Yawn. And the same story applies for the other versions. Unlike the previous game, however, there's actually an itinerary for the following locales as depicted in the film, obviously, in all three versions. You've got the Plaza Hotel, Central Park, the semi-renovated townhouse of Kevin's Uncle Rob, a minor character seen in the first film during the Paris apartment scene decorating the Christmas tree, portrayed by Ray Toller, and finally the epic as hell chase from the townhouse, past the streets of the Big Apple, to the Rockefeller Center Christmas tree. Your basic controls, depending on which version you're playing, are as follows. Your traditional D-pad moves Kevin around as always, while up makes him enter doors and calls for the elevator, which you can pull off in the Super NES version by pushing X, and down makes him duck and pulls off his best Pete Townsend power slide whilst running. In the NES and Game Boy versions, B and A are used to fire your weapon and jump respectively, while the same also applies in the Super NES version, the Y button isn't used until later. And finally, in the NES and Game Boy versions, you can use select to swap out your weapons, Whereas in the NES version, aside from swapping your weapons, you can also display your status elements, your score, how many lives you've got remaining, life count. Whereas in the Super NES version, you can swap out your weapons by using L and R. In terms of power-ups and various weapons, tactics, the whole nine inches, the usual pizza slices are back, except an extra life is gained upon finding and munching on six slices this time around, and or obtaining an entire pie. So are the cookies, which come in packs of four, if you obtain 20 of them, either loose or in 5 complete packs, a unit of power is replenished. There's also a bell for an improved offensive spin jumping technique, a candy cane or the usual aftershave for temporary invincibility, whereas for the latter, considering how rare it is, provides you with an ultimate overhaul in terms of his basic physical abilities. Getting to Kevin's offensive approaches, the aforementioned Pete Townsend-inspired slide is his only physical offense, while he can use his tranquilizer dart gun for stunning a necklace, like in the film, for making his enemies slip, and even two types of flying fist bazookas, one of which smashes the fuck out of a single enemy, and is good for two shots, and the other of which does the exact same goddamn thing, except it deals with more than one enemy, and you can even run after the latter type fist to elevate the body count to a higher extent. Upon reaching stage 3, you can actually make use of every indoor article as traps to outwit the usual primary pair of antagonists. As one could have possibly expected, while Harry and Marv make yet another return in later parts of the game aside from a few cutscenes, other enemies include an appropriate yet out of place lineup, including various hotel employees, Mr. Hector, his assistants, maids, clerks, kitchen staff, etc., and even its guests, including hard nosed detectives. Seriously, who the hell is he supposed to be? The half anorexic fuck twat brother of Hercule Poirot? Living luggage, including suitcases and bags, and even equipment, some of which are hazards to avoid, which I'll get to momentarily. Outsiders including thugs and punks that hide in the bushes, rats, bats, pigeons dropping twigs, with the obvious exception of the aforementioned homeless pigeon lady found in the sewers at the end of stage 2. And I swear to god, if your senses aren't in check every minute, they'll leave your ass reeling in more ways than one like it's no one's goddamn business. 
Same story with the first and only boss, other than the wet aka sticky bandits, in the entire game, namely that fat ass hotel chef. And don't even get me started with those far from commonplace hazards, including vacuums, which if you get near them, they'll suck your ass up, resulting in an instant death, pillows thrown by maids, rooms, kitchenware, floating trash can covers, I could go on all damn day or night. Challenge-wise, considering all the factors I've pointed out, like every great game out there, the shit gets progressively easy, but man does the intensity kick in. Although those previously mentioned power-ups are readily available for the taking, they're very far and few between, and depending on which version you're playing, you either get a once-in-a-gameplay-span continue opportunity, or total jack shit, resulting in, yep, you guessed it. Graphically, once again, it depends on which version you're playing. Though the Super NES Edition is slightly better than its 8-bit counterparts in terms of presentation and appropriate animations by comparison, the latter of which could have used more work. Everything else, from the backgrounds, all the way to the various other characters, animation-wise, leaves way more than necessary to be desired. And for the last goddamn time, let's not get each other started with those second-rate digitized stills. Seriously, I could have orchestrated a better design attempt than what we're looking at, that is, if it were up to yours truly. For the music and sounds, composed as usual by Imagineering's own Mark Van Hack, our few tracks are rather recognizable, considering they are somewhat based on the John Williams score, especially the Plaza Hotel Stage 1 theme. Hell, if I had to pick a personal favorite, no sugarcoating intended, that is, in the case of all these three entries shown here, if at least one of them, it would definitely have to be the wet and or sticky bandits theme in the cutscenes, but yet again, they eventually turn out to be a total fucking bore fest in comparison to the previous Home Alone games, as well as, yep, you guessed it, those abrasive as ball sound effects! As far as Home Alone 2's replayability, no matter which version you're playing, in between each playthrough, you'll be begging to tackle every later stage like your dear life depended on it, but then again, not so much. Other than that, please refer back to that same statement Riley Sky made about the Super NES and Game Boy versions of Home Alone. In fact, do yourself a favor and hold out for our combined upcoming final verdict after the next string of opinions made out by myself and another special guest yet to be featured, 